escape the final frontier. The stories came, contained within this content are the after 5 p.m. and before 8 p.m. escapades of a middle-aged space nerd with a fro. Continuing to talk about things that only interest me for bonus content. I will talk about space news, pop culture in space, and shop talk, ramen, and break down the latest episode of Star Trek, whatever is coming out from the latest franchise. And also whatever is popping in my head. If you're up for this journey, just know that this is a metered, shade, laced opinion. If you don't agree, don't subscribe, but I hope you will. And thanks for the support. Americans return to space as Discovery clears the tower. Although I find it, and most people find it necessary, the participation of the billionaires in the new space race, but it still doesn't shock me that it comes with an uh, unintended uh, price or unintended effects. For example, we have become dependent on the reusual, uh, reusable booster rockets from the SpaceX program to put satellites and set up a more cohesive uh, satellite program in a cosmos. But these, it appears that the satellites are leaking radiation. That also is kind of photobombing or interfering with radio astronauts astronomers in a recent study that just was released um, the, um, on the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics. They basically have known this for years, have made calculations, and have tried to edit out the interference. But at the same time, there has been additional radio frequencies as well as other radiation that uh, has interfered with the study of the cosmos um, that they had in intent. So it looks like they're going to have to go back, either get more powerful, uh, create more powerful algorithms so the computers can filter it out, or they're going to have to filter it out. So, but the price of communication also can hinder communication and study is really bright. And I, I figure we have talked about in the previous segment about we're surrounded by sound and other things. It's just interesting that these satellites are also interfering with the study and with light, et cetera. And it's interference or noise when it's impeding some other frequency. But I bet we can learn from this and also use the interference or this particular, all these wavelengths in a way that can also spark creation. And I guess it is when we have to create algorithms to filter it out and to make the uh, observations more um, um, exact so that therefore it sparks more creativity and spark um, more innovation going on in the space of it all? Well, I received a uh, text or a notification from one of my, or the sound editor for the podcast. And I was basically um, just ecstatic about um, the news. Uh, Matt, shout out to Primordial Sound Archives. Um, the biggest thing, which is massive, is there is a gargantuan black hole switches on and it becomes one of the brightest objects ever seen. 
It's over 10 billion light years away. It just basically just lit up the sky. I'll basically include the um, um, artist rendition of it um, in the extended podcast notes to review on Dale's Angels Inc. blog. This black hole dubbed J221951, that sounds like a uh, homage or a quick pick numbers if I've ever seen one. It basically brightened so that the um, astronomers thought it was some stellar explosion. More than likely, it was probably a gravitational wave and some fast moving ripple, kind of like a shock wave um, in time by some uh, cosmic collision. And it was probably generated um, at the collision of two dead stars known as neutron stars. And these are called kilonova. What I did think is, has anybody tried to put it to music? Because there are areas of reds, orange, yellow, light and dark. And there seems to be a symphony within the lightning of this explosion, which I think is absolutely dope. I also have been, if you notice the background of this podcast, I've actually uh, put or had mixed the sonification, not just of the Virgo constellation, but also of the dark and light areas of the Saturn moon, which I think when we when we look at these things, these artist rendition, how our brains, how computers interpret light sound waves, because we're surrounded by sound and it would be noise if we didn't know how to filter it. But it all I think of it is how all of it, it sounds like music to me, synthesizers. And on some other type of wavelength, I recognize the musicality of space sounds and even the musicality of the rings of Saturn and how dope it is. It basically encouraged me to create something else, to put the beauty to sound and just make more beautiful things. And that's how these creations are live on infinitely because we think of different ways to be able to not only present them, but we are encouraged to create other things based on the things that are surround us. And it's all, all of these things are symphonies in the making. It's just that I can't play an instrument, but I can recognize the sound. I put it to words, I put it to encouragement, or I create whole podcasts based on it. And how dope is that? But check out the sonification of Saturn's rings and Virgo um, in on my podcast iTunes playlist that you can actually download for immediately listen and stream immediately on um, iTunes as probably well as Amazon. Check it out. So what am I eating in this episode of Tempro is eating and drinking? I'm drinking my typical dirty gin martini, high-end Bombay Sapphire, uh, top shelf uh, martini, shake and not stir, two, three olives. This today's stuff with garlic adds a different dynamic. However, I decided that I ha- already had the ingredients for egg foo young. So I was going to actually have my egg foo young and I wasn't going to have to pay $30 for it from the Chinese restaurant. And then I got started looking one, was looking up the recipe. I also looked up the history of this totally wrong dish that I absolutely adore. What are the origins of this delicious dish? 
Although the French coined this term omelet back in the 16th century, which are basically essentially egg filled pancakes with meat and other seasonings, it's actually changed over um, the ensuing centuries um, and to come what we have gotten this deep fried dish from the 1950s in the United States. Actually, it goes back even further because back in the 1800s, probably in San Francisco somewhere, there were full young egg slices, some a Shanghai recipe um, that they would whip up with minced ham. And it was named after something of a lotus flower. Um, but the difference between this and the omelet, it has a sauce, not a hollandaise sauce, but usually a brown sauce, peanut variety um, that, that comes to mind when you actually make this up. It became uh, a staple in 1950s when it was filled with eggs, vegetables, meat, or seafood, and it's normally pan fried. I basically made the shrimp egg fu young version um, with the wok that I bought, oh man, back in 2000. Um, I don't use it that often, but I'm glad I never threw it away um, because the sh shrimp egg fu young version with peanut oil was bomb. And even though I kind of sort of followed the recipe, I probably could have left the salt out of the sauce version because I found it um, a little bit salty because the chicken broth that I used was salted as well as the soy and the oyster sauce, even though it was vegan. But it ended up being dope. And again, the pictures will be in the podcast notes for your perusal. And it's just so amazing that I did not fall asleep for the rest of the afternoon after eating such a heavy meal. And I had a little bit more over some white rice and I'm probably gonna eat more of it um, tomorrow, but it was so good. I wish y'all had smell of vision The video of it, I don't think does it justice um, because that was probably one of the best uh, meals I've had in a while. Also, the red uh, Tennessee version of jollof with shrimp that I had yesterday was also bomb. And I'll probably include that in the podcast notes. I basically, it was a version of jollof rice made from the Ghanaian uh, version of it, but I added shrimp and I took great pictures. And it was, if pictures are, are worth a thousand words, that was 2 million words right there. So enjoy the pictures. I love cooking. And my sister's visit, which is also crazy, we're just going to eat our way through my uh, Instagram post because she says we are basing her visit on the stuff that I post on Instagram. So navigate to my Instagram, Tinfro is reading, to see what I'm eating as well as um, the Dale's Angels Inc. blog to see what I post and what people are liking. I cook for my, well, let's back up. My podcast is I talk about what I like to read and what I like to eat. And I'm just bringing y'all along for the ride. You don't have, if you don't agree with it, that's on you. Um, but I'll keep posting and I'll keep uh posting the pictures and posting the recipes. You can modify as you need to. As I said, I would probably not add any salt to this particular sauce or recipe, probably not even um, to the mixture of the egg foo young or the shrimp egg foo young because it's not necessarily needed because if you're gonna use salted versions of the oyster sauce as well as the soy sauce, you don't need to add any extra sauce. It's in those particular parts of the recipe. How 
many times have we heard that um, jam, y'all ready for this jock jams? Um, you gotta jam to this. You gotta be ready for this. I'm just saying it. at what's going on in the league as far as Dallas Cowboys. How It's wild that we can come off a 12 win or a winning season and still choke in the playoffs. A lot of that has to do with what they call three steps to uh, the success. It all rests. The AFC, they, they would claim is at its weakest point. We have the best defense and offense in league history but we just seem to can't pull it together. We seem to fall apart off or, you know, postseason. And keeping Dak healthy, um, now that the offensive coordinator has been fired and the coach uh, McCarthy is taking over um, play calls, it's, we'll see how that actually goes. I didn't know he was actually coach out at Green Bay. And they had some winning season for many years. I hope he brings that shine back to this newer team. And if they let the young guys like Parsons and CeeDee Lamb, those guys out and with a coordinated effort that can keep us, everybody on the team, veterans and young boys alike, that is what's going to get us through the playoffs and finally get back to the Super Bowl after 30 years. That's what I'm saying. And I don't understand the issue why Beasley, they're letting him um, come back. And they said he's what? He's a uh, tryout. He's trying not to try to get back on the team. If he's, if it's any indication who had more steam and more consistency was Ezekiel Elliott. I don't think Cole Beasley is going, is going to make such a difference. I don't know how he would fit into this new offensive game that's going to not run out of steam and it's going to get us through the playoffs. I don't see how he would fit in there. But if they have the top three, uh, like Beasley and Ezekiel Elliott and um, Dak, and they were all healthy, that would be my dream. And it would be, but the reality is, I don't think if they're going for a new rebranded, of offensive line. I don't know how a 34 year old with all those hits and to keep him healthy, how would that look on this new team? I'm not sure where he would fit in. It's no shade, it's just the truth. So I'm not going to be reading from listeners this week, even though I took a week off pause. I was doing absolutely nothing all the week of independence, the 
celebration of the independence of America from the British imperialism, which is dope because I, I think this was, I don't remember or recall watching this last year, but Independence Day is probably, that was released uh, back in 1996. It's probably one of my favorite movies. And I just realized that almost 30 years ago, what is that, four, um, 27 years ago, Independence Day was released. I think I bought the DVD, watch expanded version, and it was so freaking dope, which I watch with on my, um, finally, my PlayStation 5. This was what I do recall from it, and I wanted to make a couple of points. Uh, Jeff Goldblum's Bro Walk, still gangster. Uh, Will Smith was dorky. Even after with Men in Black and Mike Lowry, he still was really dorky. I watched this and I looked at the character arcs and the president and everybody else. And this was the last time Vivica Fox was not overdone. She, her nose, look at her nostrils, y'all. One nostril was bigger than the other. I think she had some nasal collapse. Um, she had a, has probably since had her nose reconstructed. Um, it's straight, but it's not as Michael Jackson-ish. This movie was dope because it was based on the premise of the whole premise of Area 51. These original, and I, find, I didn't find out until Resurgence, which is basically Independence Day 2, that these beings are called harvesters. It crashed back into Earth back in the 50s. They sent a scout ship, um, and then they came back uh, in 1996 with the intent on just stripping the our world of its natural resources and then bouncing. And it's obvious that they've done it time and time again. They basically take the whole civilization they're like wasps. They just take the whole hive from place to place, get the resources, destroy the universe, and, and live. And in Resurgence, we get a little bit more of the backstory that these harvesters are colonizers on crack. And their enemy is the only one that... Their enemy is the only one that basically... Um, can has the know-how to uh, destroy them. So they have to get, it's like they're all Scorpios. They have, they're on some get back kind of ish. So, and the orb that was presented to earth was in a means to basically a warning, but we in our infinite wisdom shot it down. It takes us a minute to figure all of this out uh, the International Legacy Squad, some revamped flying F-15s. Data was in a coma for 20 years. He gets back up. Still Hubble has not been decommissioned. It's kind of dope. We got the James Webb. But it was so many years behind schedule that that just landed, what, last year? But anyways, the information that they actually brought back and the unity that it required almost for civilization to be almost destroyed is what bound us together and what held us together at the same time. And then the president basically risked his life so his next generation, his daughter and her boyfriend can actually um, live. And then they go on, destroy the mothership and the queen bee. We're all saved. And the big uh, interplanetary harvester slash Earth, literally Earth mover, takes back off. All the alien ships basically crash land. And we go away happily ever after to prepare to do, to take the war to them. It basically, it ended like it was supposed to portray like a cart three. I don't think it ever released, but I'm going to have to look that up. And if I can find it or some type of trailer, um, or if it was one of those things that was shelved before it could even get off the ground, 
I'll basically have that hopefully by next go oh, the next um, uh, bonus episode. It was amazing that this uh, sci-fi adventure was nominated for every award that you can think of. It was nominated for Best Sound back in 1997. It won for Best Effects 1997. Um, and then it won a whole bunch of international awards from BAFTA um, to the Academy of Science Fiction, um, the Czech Awards, Japanese Norway, MTV Awards, the score won a Grammy. But the follow-up resurgence, not so much. Although I thought the action and the graphics were better, it was nominated, uh, not even any uh, Academy Award nomination, but the same like BAFTA and some in, um, international nominations, but no real winners, not as big as the original. Um, I thought that was interesting. Um, I don't know if the characters were as well developed or if people just couldn't get past Will Smith not being in it. How did he die? I don't know if it was a crash landing or it was natural causes. Vivica passed away trying to get rid, uh, rescue a mother. She ended up being a nurse and was in a bad wig. Um, she looked more like, a, I don't know who she looked like, but that was a bad wig. Um, I just realized that. Um, Jeff Goldblum was deep. We didn't get to watch him walk as much or at all. Um, but I thought his the guy from Barney Miller uh, being his father and rescuing the kids on the bus, that was dope. <laughs> but there weren't as many one-liners and moments like the first one. It's not like I'm going to put this on my uh, look list for to watch every single year, which I've done for a while until the pandemic. Um, they're not as many memorable things as I got to get me one of these, you know, you have to have, there wasn't, there was no standout actor besides Jeff Goldblum and he didn't have many one liners, even Data's character or Professor Oaken's character. There wasn't the same type of one liners, freshness and hysteria that hystericalness that was on the, from the first one. So that's why I don't think it actually did as well. Um, lots of characters. Some people I recognize from other uh, um, films, but it just still wasn't the same. So with that said, um, just to make the comparison, also has given me something to look for. Is there an Independence Day 3? So we'll see. I wanted to end my broadcast or this recording with just some fresh beats and a, as a reminder for us to be kind to ourselves, be kind to our minds, my beats. and keep creating. I mean, there's just so much horrible things and mean things going on in the world. And this is not goodbye. This is just until we meet again or until I record and drop another episode. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I've enjoyed creating it. Check me out on social media. Tinfro is reading on Instagram, TV Food Wine Girl on Twitter, and Tinfro is reading the book club. I hope to get into a better state of mind as we recover as a nation from just the tragic happenstance of the last several weeks. And again, I admonish you to be kind to yourself and be kind to others. Be the action that you want to be. If you want kindness, give kindness, exude kindness, and just love yourself and love others. And again, thank you for listening. Mike Beats.